Well, good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Good. Glad you're here. Um, you're brave. You're brave to, to be here tonight. Well, we need to be brave together. But um, bef before we, we really get going here, there's some stuff that I have to say because we're going to be dealing with really, really sensitive, very personal issues. And I understand that um, me giving this kind of um, disclaimer up front really won't even suffice or satisfy some people. Um, I'm going to be a hater. I'm going to be a bigot. I'm going to be a phobic of some, some kind, no matter what. But I want to tell the truth. I want to. I want to. I want to tell the truth. And so, the truth is, I have friends who are practicing homosexuals, people I care about. I have friends that have same-sex attraction that don't act out on it, but struggle with it. I have wept and <laughs> washed the feet, literally, of people who are struggling with all kind of sexual brokenness, prayed and loved and done everything that I know how to do. But the one thing that I've never done is hate anybody, Amen. ever. Ever. I don't, I don't hate people. I think probably the, the greatest demonstration of hate would be someone watching someone's life who is going off the rails and to not say a word. That's what hate is. It's not hate to speak the truth in love and say, hey, there's a different way. Would you please at least consider? Would you please at least look at it? So that's what we're here to do tonight. We're here to speak the truth in love in hopes that it'll educate the body of Christ so that we know how to respond to this issue in a way that would give Jesus honor and hopefully draw people to himself. So we're here to educate, we're here to inspire, and we're here to take a stand because our culture right now needs some people who will take a stand for what's right, but I can't say it enough, to do it in love to speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4. That's how Paul tells us to do it. That's what Jesus did. Jesus never celebrated or condoned or approved any sin ever, but he always welcomed the sinner to have an encounter with truth and then leave the result up to that person in their own decision-making process. So anyway, that's what we're here to do tonight, uh, unapologetically um, and yet with, with lots of compassion. You're going to meet here in just a few minutes. Um, I've met some brave people in my life. I can for sure tell you this, I've never met a braver 19-year-old in my life. Amen. Ever. <laughs> Ever. And you're going to hear from her. She's a, she's a champion. Um, I want to start um, now just kind of transitioning here into the scriptures and just to say some things to lay a foundation, then Chloe's going to come out. So Genesis chapter 1, all the way back to the beginning. Genesis 1, and then chapter 2, verses 22 through 24. Tell this. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female. Then the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. In the very beginning, 
this really has been undisputed for the last 5,000 years of human history, 6,000 years. But it's come under attack in the last, you know, decade or so, seriously. Well, Steve, that's an Old Testament thing, and that's too old and whatever. Well, just in case you're wondering what Jesus thought about gender, let me tell you what Jesus said about gender. You know that Jesus, who's this great Bible teacher and is this great compassionate person, and, you know, it's rare that you'll find someone who say that Jesus was a devil or was unkind. They'll say, no, I think Jesus was just a, a, he's a good guy, he's a good moral teacher. Well, Jesus, who's this good guy and this great moral teacher, he agrees with what the original text said thousands of years ago. Matthew chapter 10, verses 6 through 8, Jesus said, but from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh, so they'll no longer be two, but one flesh. From the very beginning of human history, God made man and woman. It's called binary. It's one or the other. You are either one or the other, period. I know that Facebook's told us, I don't know what the recent number is, but you know, it was like 58 different genders. It's just not true. From the very beginning, there's man and woman. And I, I sometimes have to pinch myself and go, are we even really having this conversation right now? You know, are we really even having to talk about this? Dr. Paul McHugh, um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with him, professor emeritus of psychiatry from John Hopkins University. Um, he's been referred to as the greatest psychiatrist um, in the last 50 years of American history. For 40 years, Dr. McHugh studied transgenderism and is um, <laughs> by those who are just looking for truth. He's the undisputed, um, most educated, articulate, well-founded uh, authority in, in all of the world. Dr. McHugh, listen to some of the things that he says. The idea that one's sex is a feeling, not a fact, has permeated our culture and is leaving casualties in its wake. Gender dysphoria should be treated with psychotherapy, not surgery. Transgender is a mental illness, and to enable it is to equal to collaborating with madness. He goes on, we have wasted scientific and technical resources and damaged our professional credibility by collaborating with madness rather than trying to study, cure, and ultimately prevent it. And finally, transgendered men do not become women, nor do transgendered women become men. All such people become feminized men or masculinized women, counterfeits or impersonators of the sex with which they identify. So, so this is the guy who up until 2016 is the recognized authority for human sexuality, transgenderism, etc. Nobody has studied more than him. This is just a, a taste of the things that that he has said. I've got his entire report, it's a book. Um, but since 2016, he's been canceled and attacked and he's a bigot and he's you know a hater and all that other stuff. He knows more about it than anybody. These are the words that he says. So just to lay a bit of biblical uh, foundation and a little bit of some scientific uh, truth from the authority on it, I, I wanted to start that way. Now, you need to give a really, really warm ASI welcome to Miss Chloe Cole. Could you make her feel welcome?
Thanks. How are you, Chloe? Doing good? Yeah. I'm excited to be here today. Thank you all for coming today. You had, you had, a, you had a fun afternoon today. Oh, yeah. Before we get into all this real serious stuff, like, you had some fun this afternoon. Yeah. Um, I actually went to a local gun range here. Yeah. Cut loose a little bit. Yeah, I did. Fired I, some rounds. Yeah, yeah. I had a... The only one I fired was an AK-47. The rest were kind of, they were a little intimidating for me, but it was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the great state of Tennessee. I love it here. <laughs> we're trying to get, uh, you know, our, our claws into her a little bit and tell her this is a great place to live. No state income tax, a bunch of wonderful people, you know, this could be great. No income tax. Yes, Sounds like exactly. a dream when you're from California. <laughs> well, Chloe, thank you for being here. It really is meaningful, so thanks a lot. And thank you so much for yeah. having me. So um, let's, let's start this way, Chloe. Let's start with you just helping us understand a little bit about your family history and how you grew up and just, just, the, just the regular old stuff. So I grew up in the middle of central California in the San Joaquin Valley. Um, kind of a tow cow town, not much other than uh, farming, orchards, a little bit of industry, some factories, and a local Bass Pro shop. Yay. Not a whole lot there. But I grew up in a family of five kids, and I'm the youngest of which all of my older siblings are half-siblings, and they're all considerably quite a bit older than me, about seven to eight years. So I was the baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was kind of a cool dynamic growing up. You know, I got to, like, I got to take influence from my, from my older brothers and sisters and be taken care of by them. And they were fun to be around. But the age difference kind of made it so that we didn't always get along or relate to each, to each other. Mm. And at times it did get kind of lonely, especially because at school I was also getting bullied throughout a lot of elementary and middle school. I didn't have a whole lot of friends then, and my older siblings also moved out all while I was still in elementary school. Mm. Yeah. So a bunch of it is kind of normal childhood upbringing, and then yeah. things start to change, and you're kind of there by yourself and left behind, and, and life then starts happening, and, and you start... Um, feeling things and seeing things and and you're curious about things so tell us when how old you were when you kind of went hey I'm not sure that I feel like I'm I'm like the rest of the little girls that I'm around there were quite a few things that led up to that um, especially being that I hit puberty at a fairly young age which I guess is pretty normal now because girls are going through puberty younger and younger. I was about nine years old, maybe, maybe eight, when my breasts were starting to visibly develop and I started going through the, through the motions of it. And it was pretty uncomfortable to start developing like that, especially at such a, a young age and like knowing that like there were eyes on me, like there, there were people like my peers and even adults might start looking at me in a different way. And they did. Sometimes, like, I would get my peers, like, making comments on, like, my developing breasts or, like, the rest of my body. And it was really, really uncomfortable for me, especially because I was, so every now and then, like, I al already was, like, getting comments on the way that I looked or, like, being called ugly by my peers. And I also was surrounded by not the best influences um, throughout elementary to middle school. A lot of my peers were very precocious and they would talk about really inappropriate things, like especially of like a sexual manner. Um, sometimes like we, we started getting school tablets at around, I think when I was in like fifth grade. So we were all like 10 years old. And sometimes like my peers would like, they would like show each other like porn or like send nasty messages to each other in class. At 10 years of age. Yes. And all of this really made it so that it made me, l learning about this so young, 
made it so that I started to become very uncomfortable with the idea of being a woman and being seen as a woman. It felt like a lot of my worth was being placed on me as a sexual being and on my body and appearance rather than the content of my character. And it felt like a lot of girls um, were raised to be very shallow. I, f I found it very difficult to relate to them growing up. And I was, you could say that I was a bit of a tomboy, which, I mean, for a while, I was okay with that, and I took great pride in it, but it still felt like there was something wrong with me that I just couldn't really put my finger on. Um, I didn't feel pretty. I didn't really feel like I wanted to do all these feminine things that all my girlfriends were doing. And I had some pretty negative ideas about what growing up into a woman and being a woman for the rest of my life would entail. Like, well, having to have periods every month, seven days out of the month for about half of your life did not sound very exciting to me. <laughs> um, and the possibility of getting pregnant and how scary things like childbirth were was always kind of emphasized to me when I would hear like other girls and sometimes even older women talking about it. Um, and online, like I was, I started using social media at a young age and I was introduced to, to some more things that really a young mind like mine just isn't really meant to handle. Things like abortion. Um, I would see like these feminist groups online talking about like fetuses, unborn children, calling them parasites talking about babies, like they're a worm in a woman's womb. It really just made looking forward to those things a lot more terrifying for me. Mm. And the more I heard about it, the more I just wanted to distance myself from it. I didn't even feel like I would ever make a good woman mm. because of this, because I didn't, because I wasn't necessarily feminine all the time, because I didn't want to do all of these things as a woman. And there were times that I felt like maybe I would just be happier if I wasn't one. But I didn't really actually start to think that I was one until I learned of the transgender community through social media. Um, I discovered it mainly through Instagram. Um, I'd heard the word transgender a few times. Chloe, let me, let me interrupt for just a second because I, I don't want to get past this point. So, you know, you're growing up and developing and you're having all of these different thoughts and stuff. Did you ever sense that any of your other friends were struggling with the same thing, or what, did, was there anybody that you felt like you could talk to uh, about how you were feeling, or was it, was it just so strange to you that you just wanted to keep it in? Like, what's, what's going on in your mind as you're battling all of these things? I never really talked to anybody about it, because I feel like, partly because of my age, I didn't really know how to express these feelings or how important it might be for me to do that. And I didn't really feel particularly close to any girls in my family um, or at school. So either way, I just didn't really feel comfortable opening up to anybody about it. So you're kind of bearing the weight of all of this confusion and stuff on your own little eight to 10 year old girl mind. While also not knowing just how much it impacted me. But I thought about it a lot. And I didn't really understand at the time how normal it was to feel that way. Even if I was thrust into it a little young, a little early, most girls who are going through puberty naturally feel that way about their relationships with, with other girls, with their own body. But, I mean, I would often hear the cliche phrase like, well, puberty isn't always the most comfortable, but it just felt like such a lonely experience because I felt like I didn't really have really any female role models. Mm. So listening to you talk, I'm, I'm hearing several, I mean, a, a handful of different things that are kind of contributing to what's going on in your mind, right? So kind of brothers and sisters have left home, you're by yourself, you're getting bullied at school, you're going through puberty early, um, there's nobody really 
that you trust, who's a peer to talk to. Um, you're, you're getting hammered on social media. Um, we talked earlier today about even watching cartoons and how women always seem to be portrayed as being ditzy or stupid or whatever. And so there's, I mean, there's just a lot of different contributing factors to you being not just confused, but kind of going, the whole girl, woman thing is not appealing to me right now. Yeah, I mean, it really, it really was that way. And it was something that really, really weighed heavily on my mind the, the longer it went on, but I just didn't really know who to talk to about it. But when I discovered um, the idea of being transgender, the, um, the concept of it, like I, I, I'd heard about it a few times, like in other people's conversations or like over the TV or something, but I didn't really care about it until it was presented to my face through the internet. And it was consistently being recommended to me, these posts. At first it was through communities around my own personal interests, like, uh, like cartoons, shows that I watched, um, comics that I read, books that I liked, video games. And a lot of those users were people who identified as part of the LGBT. And many of them were young women who called themselves boys. Um, and in their own posts about their personal lives, they would talk about their upbringings, their childhoods, their experiences at school, at home. And I felt like in a lot of ways, it just hit really close to home. I really connected to these people in a lot of ways in my interest and even, even like down to the way that I feel personally about myself. And it just, it really intrigued me. It was so interesting to me. Cause it, on one hand, it was so novel, like all these new words and phrases and all these colorful flags and the way that they talked about um, being a part of this community and self-discovery. I mean, I think it really appeals to a kid of that age, like in, especially in early adolescence where you're trying to figure yourself out, but you also kind of want to hang on to the comfort of childhood. Mm -hmm. And I started to wonder myself, like, what is it that makes me feel so connected to these people? Mm -hmm. And I started to experiment with labels over time until I decided, I think I'm a boy. It just, and you're it makes sense And you're how old then, Chloe? I was 12 years old. I was about halfway through my seventh grade year. So, you know, you're eight, nine years old, right in there, and puberty's happening, and so you're kind of grappling with these feelings for, for several years. Um, you get to be 12 years old, and then you're really going, hey, I think this is real. It's like I finally found the answer mm. to these feelings of, not being adequate as a woman, why I never really felt like I connected with other women. Well, n now I knew that I just had the brain of a boy in the body of a girl. You were convinced of that? Yes. Yeah. And this was an idea that I heard about a lot. Mm -hmm. So it, that, was, that was presented to you as kind of the, the logical explanation is that you were actually a boy. Basically, yeah. And I wasn't really directly interacting with anybody in the community, so nobody was telling me or demanding that I transition, really, but just, just the pure influence of just seeing it was enough to affect me. Yeah. As an impressionable, vulnerable kid. Yeah. One of the things that you told me that I thought was interesting was, um, in the transgender community, how many, uh, they're the, the youngest child, they're girls by gender. And then you, you also added another component that we hadn't talked about yet, and that is the, um, the belief that you were somewhere on the spectrum of autism. And, and that, you know, then here's some other things besides everything else we've talked about, right? You're the youngest, you're a female, and you're on the spectrum, they thought. 
so you've got all of these contributing factors. You're 12 years old, and then you've, you've got to tell somebody something about what's going on. Yeah, and at first I refrained from really telling anybody about it other than maybe like a few of my schoolmates and some of my friends online because, I mean, it's kind of a big personal announcement to just put out there. Um, and I kind of wanted to get myself comfortable and like decide a name for myself and just get used to like calling myself a boy and presenting as one and maybe try to like mimic the, like my older brothers, my dad and the boys around me before I guess I was convincing enough to tell people about it. And then eventually I decided to tell my older sister. And I really wanted to tell my mom about it because I felt like they deserved to know. And I knew that if I wanted to go any further into it, like they would have to be a part of it because they're my family, they're my parents, they're responsible for me. And I wasn't really sure about how to do that for the longest, but I saw a post from a person who I'd been following for a while within the transgender community. And she came out to her mother through a letter. And it was, I decided to do the same thing because it was comfortable. It gave me comfortable distance and it kind of gave my mom and dad some time to think about how they would respond and just think over it for a little bit. And when they did, they responded pretty positively. They were respectful of me and they... Were you surprised by their response? Um, a little bit. I, I, I wasn't expecting them to respond negatively necessarily. Um, but sometimes like I would hear them talking about like transgender celebrities like from TV or something to be like, well, she doesn't really look like a woman, stuff like that. So I was afraid of like kind of getting the same response from them, but they were, they were very respectful and they wanted to make me feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. So you, you start to have the conversation with your parents now at, at 12 years of age and at some point doctors are gonna start getting involved. Yeah, um, so my parents, even though at face value, they were very, um, very sensitive to it, they also had a healthy dose of skepticism. And my dad especially kind of saw right away that this probably has to do with my struggles with my self-esteem and with fitting in and just being a creative tomboy type all pretty normal stuff and they didn't really know what to do about it necessarily um, they saw it as a mental health issue correctly so and they started doing their research online and what they found was that uh, Kaiser Permanente our healthcare provider was rated as the top provider of care and uh, like psychological care for trans identified and gender dysphoric youth. So they decided to hire a, um, a therapist for me through our provider. And what happened? Yeah, they didn't really push back on it at all. They pretty as soon as I walked in and gender was brought up, they just took the affirmative approach asking, well, what's your preferred name? What's your what's your birth name or your dead name? What is your preferred pronouns and what do you identify as? And they pretty much only went by that. And you're 12 and at that point. Yeah, I was 12 going on 13. Yeah. And I was having some real struggles at home and at school that wasn't really being paid attention to by this therapist. So naturally over time, I started to get more and more distressed because I was telling him, well, not only about my gender dysphoria and, and wanting to be a boy, but also about the other things that were going on for me. And he would just kind of be like, oh, yeah, that's, that's strange. And then just kind of move on, not really giving me any advice on how to deal with this, any coping mechanisms. Just or how those things might be contributing to. Right. And I mean, you can't really talk about that to your own patient in California. You can't really question as to whether these feelings of, den of gender dysphoria might not be innate in whether they're coming from 
other issues in your life because that could be considered conversion therapy in my state by law. Yeah. Um, but I, after a while, I, I was getting reasonably pretty frustrated and with how I was being bullied at school just for presenting myself differently, having short hair, dressing like a boy, but still looking kind of awkward it made me want to go further into it. I wanted to be on hormones because, well, the transgender community taught me that that's just, that's the natural pipeline. That's how it's supposed to be. And the earlier you start, the, the better it is. And I also wanted to stop being made fun of. I wanted to prove to the people that were, that were bullying me, that were pushing back on it from school, that one day I would be. One day I would look like a boy and I would command their respect. And so I started telling my mom and dad, I'm not satisfied with this. I don't just want to be socially transitioning. I don't want to just try to be a boy. I want to actually become one. That's all I want. And they were getting pretty concerned the more I pushed for it. And so they turned to my doctors. Um, I had a gender specialist who had diagnosed me with gender dysphoria, and I believe this was the doctor that they went to um, during this appointment. I don't think I was there for this because I don't have any recollection for it of it, and my mom and dad say that I wasn't there in the room, but they were talking about their concerns. They were asking why there had to be such a rush for me to do this so young, um, what the consequences might be, why whether I might regret it or not down the line. And I mean, pretty much right away, they just brushed it all off as them just being stubborn and ignorant. They told them, well, you know, I'm sure you know that it's not normal for a child to be pushing for this so much. It's very clear that she knows exactly what she wants. It doesn't matter that she's a child. She knows, and she is a boy. And it's very unlikely that she's going to regret this. I mean, the figures are really less than about one or 2% for these kids who go through it. But if you don't affirm her in her identity and her decision to undergo these treatments, then you could have a dead child on your hands. You hear that? you're going to have a dead child on your hands. So you're going to medical professionals, right, supposedly the experts, and they're not paying attention to not only just normal things that, that kids going through puberty go through, um, they're not paying attention to struggles that are happening at home. They're really just ushering you in and, and affirming this decision that will alter the rest of your life and you're 12 years old. Yes, I mean, it goes against what I think any parent, any caretaker of a child, any older sibling, and really anybody with common sense knows about child psychology. Children don't know what they want. Yeah. And like you said, I, I, I did have like a lot, of, a lot of things going on in my life that were fairly abnormal, but also were normal. Normal struggles that were perverted and something that they weren't. Yeah. And the doctors took my parents' healthy concern for me and they really twisted the knife in their stomach. They turned it into fear yeah. for their child's life. Yeah. And as a parent, what wouldn't you do for the life of your kid? Right. So they, they did whatever they took, they thought it would take for me to stay alive. And so they, I think, were really emotionally manip manipulated into allowing me yeah. to undertake these procedures. 
I don't think it was consent at all, even if they, they signed off on it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's hard, I think, for a lot of parents to imagine that they could ever be manipulated to that degree. But not having a child who's going through those struggles and watching it day in and day out and then having the experts uh, you know, kind of affirm what the child is thinking and then have the experts uh, produce, I mean, just unbelievable amounts of fear. Like I can, I clearly see how your parents were set up. Like I, I, I don't look at your parents as some wicked, evil group of ignorant people. Like I see, quite frankly, I see how the devil works in that. Right, it's not, um, <laughs> you know, we haven't talked enough about this part. <laughs> the, you know, we're not, we're not talking about a political issue here. We're, we're talking about a spiritual issue. I, I, I told you in the very beginning, I read the scriptures, not only from Genesis chapter 1, but from Mark chapter 10. Like, this is God territory. And wherever there's God territory, there's going to be Satan territory to try to come and steal, kill, and destroy, to twist and pervert, and, and to um, inflict as much damage as he can. And so I, I see the setup here it, clearly, what's happening not only in your life but in your family's life and what the doctors are doing. Earlier today we were talking about kind of the three different doctors that you think are out there, right? There's, there's the doctor who's... Um, probably a, a good-hearted person but is is just clueless yes um, and then the second guy is just he's just apathetic and doesn't care and just whatever you want is fine I'll agree and do whatever you want me to do to your body and then the third type of doctor is the doctor really that does have evil intentions who's who's knowingly following an agenda and is looking for money and power and fame and honestly, I think I must have had all three of those. I haven't really ascertained who is which, but I definitely think that my surgeon was the laissez-faire type. Mm -hmm. Because I, I just can't imagine operating on a perfectly healthy girl in good conscience. I mean, yeah. he had to do a routine physical exam of my, bre of my breasts um, before operating on me in an examination of the tissue afterward. No signs of cancer, no lumps, not even the gene, I don't think. Perfectly healthy kid. And he said, when I reported to him the regrets and also the complications that I was having with it, he said, well, since you're, uh, you're a gender specialist and your psychiatrist uh, cleared you for it, I thought that everything was just okay. No critical thinking at all. That's a really, really scary situation right there. When the people that you're trusting the most with, I mean, the most private, personal, lifelong decision-making choices can be so flippant, can be so casual about it. Let alone done by a 13-year-old. Yeah. I mean, I was making, I was being allowed to make decisions around my reproductive system and development before I could even list off all of the organs in my reproductive system. I didn't know that there were four st stages to the menstrual cycle. All I knew is that there was a period and then somehow at some point after that I could potentially get pregnant. And I didn't even know what things like fallopian tubes were or what a cervix was. Either way though, it doesn't matter. It didn't matter if I had a full understanding of how it works because children have only lived so long They've only had so much experience in the world and they can't really understand what it means to make a permanent decision. They don't know what forever means. Yeah. So, um, backing up a little bit before the, this, the double mastectomy. So, um, hormones and blockers and all that stuff, you, you start they start prescribing that to you. Yes. Yeah. At 13 and a half. That was when I took my first blocker shot 
and I was on them for about a year. And about a month after the first shot of that was when I was put on the testosterone. And this all happened within, well, my first blocker shot was maybe less than half of the year after I had started seeking therapy. So it was very, very expedited. Mm -hmm. And they actually went against the standards of care at the time in doing that. Yeah. Um, Lupron. Talk about that for a second. Um, because I was already a few years into puberty, the drop, the total drop in sex hormone production in my body basically made it so that as a 13 year old girl, I was experiencing a chemically induced menopause. And so I was experiencing like hot flashes, like full body tingling and itching. Um, I was very lethargic a lot of the time. It didn't feel great. And it also induced about two weeks in, a very heavy period, probably the heaviest I'd ever had in my life by that point. Um, and you'll often hear from these activists that puberty blockers are just used to, uh, to delay or temporarily stop puberty. But you can't just stop a, naturally, a natural bodily process. It's just not going to happen. It's going to mess something up. You can't interfere with nature. Yeah. But they also don't account for the fact that in girls, it induces something that they're already very insecure about. And it throws off this natural balance entirely. Yeah. So it was very uncomfortable for me. And I woke up every day basically just counting on the days until the very next intervention, which was testosterone. And it was a very powerful drug especially for a kid that age to be taking. Um, Let me interrupt you real quick, Chloe, because I, I want people to, to hear what you said of, um, about Lupron and then just expand on a little bit to, to show the insanity of this, this drug. Lupron is given to sexual predators and it causes them to go through chemical castration. Now listen to me, if that isn't crazy enough, it's given to sexual predators to, to, to cause chemical castration, but then the government decides it's too cruel and unusual to give sexual predators, but will give it to 12-year-old little girls. So now you're getting testosterone next. It was, I mean, after that month or so of having no energy, not really any drive to do anything, and just complete physical discomfort, it was, it was great. It was amazing, actually. I mean, I had this pretty much immediate boost in my energy, um, I finally didn't feel sleepy all the time or depressed. It was almost like a stimulant in that way. And I felt very confident all of a sudden. I started feeling even a little bit competitive. And I also had a very massive, uncomfortable increase in my libido. And it was very difficult for, for me to deal with all the effects of this. It made it very difficult for me to process negative emotions like anger and sadness. It was a lot harder to, to cry. And I could cry for hours on end, no emotional release at all. And the, phys the physical effects started to roll in um, less than maybe a month afterward. And the first effect that I can really name would be the voice drop, which was very sudden, very, very intense. Like I hadn't been out to anybody by this point in time in my late eighth grade year, but people were starting to notice around me like, hey, she's starting to, her face, her body, her voice is starting to change. It's like she's becoming a completely different person. And it felt like I was. Um, 
throughout a lot of high school, my voice was actually deeper than most of my male peers and even a lot of my teachers. It, it's, it wasn't supposed to, but after I've stopped, it's actually raised up quite a bit. Um, and I started developing muscle. I started getting thicker body hair, facial hair. Um, my eyebrows started thickening. Um, my body shape started to change entirely. And I was losing fat in my hips. And it was a lot easier to gain muscle. And I felt like for the first time in my life, I looked good. I looked great. And I had control over the way that I looked now. So, you know, you're 18 and you're, I mean, you're transitioning, like it's, it's starting and now we get to when you had surgery. I was in my sophomore year of high school by that point. And by that point in time, like most people at school didn't even know that I was a biological female anymore, other than people who I went to like middle or elementary school with. And for a while, things were going good. They were going great. And I was, I was having that uh, gender euphoria that the transgender community talks about. That feeling of finally being comfortable in my own skin, finally being my true self as a man, or as a boy, soon to become a man. And everybody in my life knew me as Leo, and I became one of the boys, but it was a lot more than I had bargained for. I realized that being male or being perceived as such is kind of a huge responsibility. And it was a lot on my shoulders. And I was going through a lot that I felt like now that I was expected to be a guy and man up, I couldn't really talk to anybody about. So combined with the emotional instability and inability to process my emotions that testosterone brought about, there was the social pressures and it really started to weigh down on me, especially because, well, I now look like a boy, and like any other 15, 14 year old boy. And there were quite a few girls who had crushes on me, but I didn't really have any interest in them. I was still interested in men. And I got to see all my friends get into their first relationships and I just kind of felt like I was being left behind in a lot of ways, and it was really humiliating for me. And it just, it felt lonelier. It made me a lot more conscious of myself over time. And even as my body and face started to masculinize more and more with each day, I still had breasts. And I had to wear this, I felt like I had to wear this thing um, called a, a, a binder, which is basically like a, a compression device used to hide the appearance of the breasts. And this thing was pretty tight, pretty uncomfortable. I would wear it for upwards about eight hours per day because that's how long my, my school days were. Um, whenever I'd go out working out or with friends or swimming. And I really hated it. And I really just wouldn't be able to take off my shirt and not have to wear this thing, not have to have people ask like what that thing is sticking out of the collar of my shirt and just be like all the other boys my age. And I also had an unresolved sexual trauma from my eighth grade year. Um, that happened while I was very early in my transition. It happened in a crowded classroom with lots of other kids and yet nobody reported what happened. It almost felt like either nobody noticed or they just didn't care about me. They didn't care enough to report it to the teacher or the office. And it kind of broke my trust in everybody around me. It reinforced my negative feelings around being a woman. Um, I mean, up until that point, I didn't really care to hide my breasts because at that point in time, everybody still knew that I was a biological female, but now I had an incentive to. Now I felt like I had to protect myself from this happening ever again. And I never reported it to anybody, not even the school staff, because I mean, I couldn't even trust them with 
abiding by the 504 IEP plan that my parents put in place for me to help me with my schoolwork. So how can I trust them with helping me feel comfortable when there is a boy who sexually assaulted and groped me at school? So it went unresolved over the years. And I basically just told myself to, to man up. And for the longest time, I had largely forgotten about it. But that fear of being taken advantage of sexually stayed in the back of my mind. And it was in my mind while I would use the male restroom facilities and locker room facilities. And honestly, that fear wasn't too unrealistic. You know, I mean, if anybody knew that I was actually a fully intact biological female and I was caught alone in one of those facilities at school, something terrible could have happened to me again. And I wanted to be free of my breasts for all of these reasons. And again, none of it was really explored. And the moment that I started expressing to my doctors again that I wanted to go through another intervention, that I wanted to go under the knife, and get what they called top surgery. They were very laissez-faire about it. They were like, okay, let's get you, let's get you started. And when my parents expressed their concern for me, they were again met with, do you want a dead child? Do you want a dead daughter or a living transgender son? And so the summer after my sophomore year, when I was 15, going on 16 years old, I had my breasts permanently surgically removed. And at first, I was very excited about it. When I woke up from, when I woke up in the recovery room, I, it was like, wow, this is a huge step and it's finally over with. It wasn't over with. I still had to go through the, the full healing process, but I was looking forward to that. One day I would be able to take my shirt off and the scars and the skin grafts would be mostly fully healed and I would be able to bear my chest to the sun and I'd be able to swim, work out, hang out shirtless, just like how I thought men were supposed to. That day never came um, because I realized very soon after that it was a mistake, that all of it, every single part of my transition was not supposed to happen, that in the end, I wanted to be a woman and a mother, and I also never fully recovered. I'm still going through the healing process to this day. Chloe, what do you, what do you attribute that massive revelation to? Like, what, what happened to make you say, oh my gosh, what have I done? What have I been doing? Is there any one thing that you can pinpoint or a couple things to say, this is what got my attention? It was a very slow process, relatively speaking, coming to that, that revelation. And I mean, for most people, surgery regret of any kind takes about seven to 10 years to fully appreciate. I, I'd say that, if anything, I was one of the lucky cases that I realized so soon. And up until I had that surgery, I was very confident in my transition and my identity as a boy. But I think just the huge shock that it had on my mind, on me emotionally, on my body, just, it was horrific to deal with. Um, I mean, just looking down at my chest once they took the stitches out and I was able to take off the, the post-surgery binder, it was very difficult to look at what was left of my breasts. And I would have to see it every single day 
after every bath, after every shower, I'd have to remove and redo the dressings and take care of the wounds. And it just became a stark reminder of what it was that I had lost. And this was the point that I started to realize just how difficult, how different it was to be a boy, to be seen as one at the very least. And that there were things that I really missed about being a girl. Those intimate friendships, um, having more, more room to have like a heart to heart with other people, um, being able to express myself not only emotionally, but also in the way that I wore my hair or my clothing. I wish to wear makeup again. And sometimes I would wear my own girl clothes and it was comfy. But it was very difficult for the longest time to even admit that this was wrong, that I wasn't supposed to be a man because I had been so deep in it. I was maybe about three years on hormones by that point, and I hardly even looked or sounded like a female anymore. And everybody in my life was a part of my transition. They all knew me as their son, their brother, their boy cousin, their nephew, their grandson, their friend who was a boy, Leo. I'd already made such a huge investment in this. So how could I get back out? Especially since I just, I, I just lost my breasts. How could I go back? It wasn't until towards the very end of my junior year when I took a class in psychology and I learned about the psychological side of parenting and childhood development. And it was just a huge wake-up call to me because as, as a youngest child, I never really had the chance to like, take care of like, a baby or anybody younger than me or babysit, really. That responsibility of having to care for another person had never really been on my mind before. So seeing it in such an in-depth lens really woke me up to the fact that such things were precious, yeah. that they were valuable, yeah. and that one day I wanted to be a part of it too. I wanted to be a mother. I wanted to have children of my own naturally. And I also was 16 by this point. I wasn't quite an adult yet, but I was nearing the age of legal adulthood, and one day I would start having to think about things like whether I might want to settle down and get married and have a husband and a family of my own. And I wanted it. I wanted it so bad. I didn't know what my kids would call me, whether I would be dad or mom, because either way, it just didn't feel right. And how was that going to affect my kids? How was I going to tell them that dad isn't really a man? It just... In those moments of realization, it really all came crashing down, and it was painful. I couldn't keep doing that to myself, and I started realizing that it was taking more from me than I realized it ever would. It was taking parts of me away. It was taking away parts of my adulthood before I could even call myself an adult, and it could be taking away parts of my future family and children. And I couldn't do it anymore. I took the last shot and I couldn't even look at the vial of testosterone anymore or the binders. I was done. So now moving forward, I mean, I, I still, you know, I struggle with going, I'm, I'm talking to a 19 year old girl. Like Chloe's 19. We're talking about things that have happened over the last few years. 
So what does your future look like, physically speaking, health-wise? I'm lucky to say that I'm much healthier now than I was while I was on these treatments and in this mindset of being a boy. It really was incredibly destructive to me as a person, to my development in the physical and psychological sense in just about every facet of my life. And now I've just accepted, you know, I'm, I'm a woman. I don't have to put a word to these things that make you, me unique. This is just an, an unchangeable part of me, and it's a blessing. You're a woman. And I'm, I'm still struggling with some things health-wise. Um, the testosterone, I don't know just how much it's affected my reproductive system. Um, I have a fairly healthy menstrual cycle, luckily, because I started very young. I started only about a year after I started having periods, and they were very irregular by that, by, by that point in time. It's a miracle that I even have them right now, but I don't know how it might have affected like my egg quality or my uterus, whether I'll be able to safely carry, even if I can conceive, what birth defects or effects there might be for me as the mother while I'm gestating. Um, and I have some lasting issues with my urinary tract. Um, it kind of varies day by day. I used to get like really bad infections, maybe like once per month. Mm. And it got really bad in that initial period after I stopped testosterone for maybe about like a, about six months. That was a pretty arduous process. Um, I still have to urinate, I still have to use the restroom pretty frequently. And I have a sensitive bladder. Um, I used to get like blood clots in my urine, which was incredibly scary. And I tried to go to the doctor for this. They just kept like diagnosing me with uh, whatever condition over the phone. Like, oh, you have a UTI. Let's let's slap the antibiotic Band-Aid on it. Or let's diagnose you with this condition that we haven't even examined you for yet. And eventually, the worst went away. But now I don't know what was going on. That terrifies me. Yeah. And I think the worst side effect that I'm dealing with right now might be with the skin grafts that they use. Um, the healing with them has been not great. Um, they've been sort of dry, and sometimes they would even crack, which I would just address using like nursing, nursing butter that like breastfeeding mothers use. And that worked for a while, but about two years post-op, I started having this issue with the wounds the healing started to regress and they started to weep fluid. And I have to wear bandages over my chest every day, which is expensive, time consuming, they're itchy. And it's just another reminder that I have every day of what I went through. And the changes to my bone structure and my appearance are permanent. And I'm lucky that now I still look like a woman because there was a period of time where I really didn't. But I'm still dealing with body image issues, especially with the loss of my breasts. It's still, it's been three years and it's still difficult for me to grapple with. I know that there's not one thing to say to the people. There's, there's not one thing to say to parents who are here or educators who are here. But if you could take just a, a couple minutes to, like what, 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 do, you, what do you say to parents today? What, what do parents need to know about what social media, what the media is doing to kids, the agenda that it's pushing, like, what do parents need to know? I mean, if you're dealing with this with your own child, the problem is this just shouldn't be an option for children at all. And luckily in the state,
here in the state of Tennessee, it's now legal to perform these surgeries and administer these medications to children. Can we thank Senator Jack Johnson right here, <laughs> leading the way. But in many other states, it's not. These doctors will go along with it. And so it'll have to be up to you as the parent to do your best to save your child from this. And it can be scary because in certain states, you can lose custody of your child if you don't affirm them. Yeah. I know a woman from Chicago who has lost her daughter because she referred her by the name that she gifted her at birth. I know several stories like this. I know that there are many families out there who are struggling with this. And it's scary out there. I mean, there's entire institutions that are against parents and children and families now. And now you have to, you might even have to go against the advice of your doctors and your, your child's counselors and school staff. These people who you're supposed to trust in raising your children. And even if you're not dealing with this, with your child's, with a child who has gender dysphoria or any stress relating to their sex, I mean, it's everywhere now. Your child is going to hear about it one way or another, either through the device, through school, through their peers, possibly even through the classroom. Yeah. And you have to be the one to talk to them about it to dispel these rumors around it, yeah. to tell them the truth and to guide them through it. Yeah. I would, I would give you two words. Wake up. Wake up. Let me give you two more words. Stand up. Wake up and stand up because it's happening all over the place. It's in curriculum in elementary age kids. Wake up, stand up, and say, not my kid and not our kids. Wake up and stand up. I can't help but thinking, too, about the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Better for a millstone to be hung around the neck of somebody and cast into the sea than to hurt one of my little ones. This is serious stuff, beloved. We live in very serious days. I want to... Um, Elise, if you could pull up uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it should be, there, there's going to be two different ones. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. And while you're looking that up, I, I, I want to, um, I want to speak truth uh, and I want to um, give hope tonight. I, I don't want to to just point out one passage of scripture that it's very heavy and very truthful and sobering. I, I want to, to um, continue with the passage and then end with hope. First Corinthians chapter six, verses nine and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And you, you look at that list, right, and there's things on there that uh, aren't of a sexual nature. You know, a drunkard and a reviler and extortion and all that stuff. But when, when you look at sexual brokenness and the sin of uh, the sins of sexual brokenness in the list that's listed there, it's really, really clear in just this one passage what the Bible says. 
if, if you are practicing these things. Don't be deceived. Heaven is not your eternal destination. Don't be deceived about it. If you are unrepentant and practicing these things, heaven is not your future. Wow. Now, Elise, if you would go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, as it continues, I want to end with hope. And such were some of you. Everybody needs to say were. And such were some of you. But what? You were washed. You were what? Sanctified. You were what? You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What that means... What that means is who we all are in our brokenness, who we all were before Christ doesn't need to be the period or the exclamation point of your life. It can be a comma, and where the story continues is, and such were some of you. Such were some of you. But here's what happened. Jesus himself got involved and he washed you and made you clean and though your sins be red like scarlet they shall be made as white as wool he washed you and he sanctified you it means that he set you apart and made you holy you mean someone who was doing these types of things could be considered holy in God's eyes? Yeah, by being washed, by being sanctified, and then being justified. Meaning that God is now treating you just as if you've never sinned. It means there's hope for every single person alive. You're an alcoholic, you're a drug addict, you're a whatever you were. And such were some of you. But Jesus got involved and he changed everything. If you're struggling with anything tonight, I'm telling you, Jesus Christ himself is the answer. And he has the power and the ability to overcome anything, any lie, Anything that any doctor, any expert, let me tell you, there are no expert like Jesus is the expert. The scripture says he saves to the uttermost. The person who seems to be the farthest away, I mean the uttermost, like untouchable uttermost, Jesus saves to the uttermost. He saves to the uttermost. Never give up on anybody. Love them. Pray for them. Speak the truth in love. Let them know they can be a whir. <laughs> and not an am. Church, don't get too holy. I'm going I'm to close with this. Don't get too holy. You remember where you came from. I'm almost 40 years of walking with Jesus. I thank God. I never have forgotten where I've come from. Jesus rescued a little punk, dope smoking, cocaine sniffing, alcohol drinking punk who started doing it when he was 12 years old. Whew. 
great is thy faithfulness. Oh God, my Father. Chloe, thanks for being here, for telling your story. I can only say this because there's a bunch of witnesses present. I think you're beautiful. I think someday you're going to make a great mom. And there's not going to be any confusion about you being mom, none at all. Thank you for sharing your story. You have blessed us tonight. We're grateful for what the Lord is doing in and through your life and what he has for your future. They are thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. You haven't even begun to see what he's gonna do with your life. Well, if you've been around me uh, much at all, you know that this is a common practice on certain occasions. Would you all stretch your hands? Sarah, come on, pop, can you pop up here real quick? Is there little steps right here or anything? You can't do that? You'll be okay. Here, come on. Y'all make Sarah Burger feel welcome here tonight. Yay. Thank you, Megan. Stretch your hand. And we're going to pray a blessing. Father, in the name of Jesus, wow. Wow a trophy of grace, another rescued one. Father, we pray a blessing over Chloe right now. Lord, we pray that every single thing that the devil meant for evil would be turned around for good. We pray, Father, for healing in Chloe's body from the top of her head, Lord, to the soles of her feet, we pray that you would renew and revive and restore every cell, every organ. Lord, that you, O oh God, the great physician who know her intimately inside and out, that you would correct every single wrong. Lord, we pray that you would be Chloe's source of joy unspeakable and full of glory, that you would continue to reveal yourself in her, that you would strengthen her faith, that you would protect her, God, that your angels would surround her as she goes and brings a message of hope and healing and truth and love to people. Lord, we pray that you would use her as your ambassador in supernatural, mind-boggling ways. We prepare, pray, oh God, that you would prepare her for her future one day at a time, one step at a time. And Lord, we can't wait to rejoice and see from this day forward and forevermore the great work that you do in and through her life. Bless her, keep her, anoint her, use her for your kingdom, for your cause, oh God. We commit her to you right now. In the matchless name of Jesus, who is the hope-giving, sanctifying, washing, justifying Son of God. In Jesus' name, bless your sweet princess, Lord. In Jesus' name, 
And God's happy people said, Amen, amen and Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Closing words. Anything you want to say. You don't well, first have of to. All, thank, thank you guys so much for having me here. Yeah. And for all of you for attending, I'm, I'm so grateful that you all came, that you all came to listen, and that you're all so kind and receptive. Because yeah. that's, that's not always the case. Not everybody has been kind to me in talking about this, this journey of mine and what I've been through. But I'm, I'm just so grateful that everybody came here today. Amen. Amen. Um, so I do have a platform online. Um, I use both X, formerly known as Twitter, I still refer to it as Twitter most of the time because I just haven't gotten used to it yet. Um, and Instagram as well. And I would say that on both, you can find me just by looking up Chloe Cool. But on Instagram, they actually recently shadow banned me because they said that my bio for my profile was too violent. <laughs> and what it describes really is my own life experience, which I, I, I guess you could say it is violent. But it was violence inflicted on me. And I'm not encouraging it. I'm using my own personal testimony to help other people. But they don't want me to get that word out. But We're going to help my you username. get the word out. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Yeah. My username on both those platforms is C-H-O-O-O-C-O-L-E. And that's three O's in the middle. I had to choose a weird username because... Chloe Cole was already taken. <laughs> but um, I'm also, I also have a YouTube channel right now. Um, and I'm working on a video series interviewing other detransitioners, other people who have gone through this path. <laughs> and they're all long form videos, so it'll be quite a time investment to listen to, but I promise that it's worth it. Y'all, uh, this isn't the last that we've heard from Chloe Cole here in uh, great Nashville, Tennessee. And I I'm, I'm telling you, because I know these people, so I'm speaking on their behalf. We got your back. Yeah. We're going to love you and bless you and support you and help you do what you're going to do in the future. This, this is not goodbye tonight in any way, shape, or form. This is... Welcome to the team, new partner, because here we go. I'm going to bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all, thank you again for being here tonight. Um, it means the world uh, to me, to Sarah, to Chloe, and um, keep your eyes open uh, in the future about what we're going to do and how we can help her because she needs she needs help and she needs love and support and we're just going to be a part of the body of Christ to be able to do that with her and for her. Thank you for your generous support and donations. It allows us to do these events. So don't forget us uh, as it comes to making your uh, monthly donations and stuff. We really appreciate it. It makes all the difference. Then I'm just going to leave you with this teaser. Last time we were together in May, I introduced you to a family that we rescued um, who were being targeted and hunted. We've got nine more. Turn to your neighbor and say nine. <laughs> We've got nine more people since I last uh, talked to you who we have gotten through all manner of checkpoints where they could have easily been killed. They're in a fairly safe place right now and we're getting ready to, to do an extraction and rescue nine more people. We can't do it. Yeah. We can't do it without your love and support, so thank you. Father, bless your precious people here tonight. God, may every good and perfect gift 
rest upon them and their families. May you give parents wisdom. Lord, may you give educators wisdom. May you give us all love and compassion for hurting people all around the world. And may we make a difference. May we be salt and light. May we wake up to what's happening around us and be your heart and hands extended to a lost and needy world. In Jesus' name, God, use us for your glory by the power of your spirit. Again, God's happy people said, amen. amen. Thank you all for being here tonight. God bless you guys.